Roaring hail, rain and winds swallowed the whale's warning sirens the evening of May 11, 1970 in the city of Lubbock. Welcome to a special edition of Inside Texas Tech. I'm your host, Robert Giovanetti. The EF5 tornado that carved a path of destruction started right here. It made its way towards downtown Lubbock on the tragic evening when 26 people lost their lives and hundreds of others were injured. Tonight, we take a look back at stories of resiliency and determination and how Lubbock and Texas Tech rose to the challenge of rebuilding the city and understanding the power of these extreme storms. So there are many things that were unusual about the, the events. Uh, the most notable thing probably was that it occurred at night, about 9.30, 9.35 at night, uh, developing near Texas Tech, actually moving up northeast uh, through, the, through the city. The, the, the storm initiated uh, on a uh, what we call a retreating dry line and the dry line is a very important uh, boundary out here in West Texas. Usually what happens, the dry line moves east during the day, give it about 3, 4 o'clock peak heating, storms will fire up, then the dry line comes back at night. What's rare about the Lubbock tornado is the dry line was actually coming back and about 9, 10 o'clock is where thunderstorms began to fire up right around Lubbock. So the fact that we had severe storms pop up along a retreating dry line is incredibly rare. It's very, very unusual for a retreating dry line itself to initiate a, what we call a supercell thunderstorm. That's the parent thunderstorm of the tornado. Uh, in this case, it happened though, and uh, for reasons that we'll probably never you know, firmly understand. If you just say to people, meteorologists anywhere across the country, the Lubbock tornado, they're gonna know what you're talking about because that was a very well-researched tornado after it developed. Dr. Fujita came to Lubbock, studied uh, the tornado, and actually proved things like multiple suction points within a tornado, proved the path of it. It was looping around as it moved through parts of the city. I hope I never see anything like that. Um, over the past few years, we've had deadly tornadoes in 2011 in Alabama and Mississippi in the Deep South. Uh, you go to 2012, what we had across the Midwest, last year across Oklahoma. You never, ever want to see anything like that. You have to be prepared, but you hope you never, ever see that. May 11th, on the, the next day, it was May 12th. I had a chance to go down there. Two, two things that really impacted me. One is I could not figure out how a straw was stuck inside a utility pole. Couldn't figure that out. I now know that the wind of the tornado had twisted, opened up the pores of it, the straw went in, and it snapped it back. Okay, but I didn't know that. The other thing was I was fascinated by a house that was completely destroyed, all right, except for the toilet. And on top of the toilet was the Bible opened up to Psalms. Now, how did the Bible survive on a toilet? Everything else is gone. You hear stories about that all the time in tornadoes. Why? Because tornadoes are wind. Every wind event is different, but tornadoes are wind. That's the thing we need to remember. I told my dad, I said, when I grow up, I want to do something where this doesn't happen again. Well, I can't stop the destruction, but we can stop people from dying. 26 people died that night. No one knew that tornado was going to hit Lubbock. No one. It came out of nowhere. Today, we have the technology to at least detect it before it hits. And our obligation is to get people to safety that quickly. It can be a whole lot more communicated. I mean, everyone's got either a tablet or a phone on them but we still rely on the legacy things that we've always used, things like weather radios. Those are a simple tool to get the message out, and that's an instant warning from the weather service. I do think we'll probably see a little bit more activity than um, what we've seen at least the past few years. It just takes one storm, though. You can have the quietest of years, and that one storm rolls through your neighborhood, and that's where you can be talking about a big problem. So a lot of times we get caught up on whether it's active or inactive season, and certainly that's important. You wanna know your likelihood's gonna increase if you have storms more frequently, but you have to be prepared for each storm because it just takes one. If it's gonna spawn a tornado, that can be all you need to wind up in a big, big problem. I do think we'll have an active severe weather season. That's the way we're gonna look at it, and we're, we're ready. In May 1970, on a very clear West Texas afternoon, then assistant professor Dr. Donald Harrigan and graduate student Larry Tanner were going about their typical day without any word of a severe storm. That evening would not just change their lives, 
but start the building blocks of what has become one of the leading research institutes of wind and extreme weather. As I recall, there was uh, uh, no forecast at all that morning of anything uh, that was going to be going on late that afternoon. So I had a very normal day uh, at the office. I grew up in Texas and, and dodged lots of tornadoes. Uh, 1970, uh, I was working downtown while I was a student. There was just a smattering of clouds that were beginning to form when I went to dinner uh, that evening. And so the thunderstorms that developed, developed very quickly. And I had actually left uh, the, uh, the dinner and was driving home. And right about uh, Broadway and Avenue Q, I got into a tremendous uh, hailstorm. There was a little shed right outside of what then was the Brookshire Inn. It was a steakhouse. And the Brookshire Inn is now Gardskis, the same, the same building. And there was a little shed that I pulled my car in under to get out of the hail, and then I went inside. My mother-in-law calls me and tells me there's tornadoes, so I hang up the phone and go outside and look at the sky. It does look very, very threatening. And about that time, this tornado from the southeast going northeast just went whoo, and all of our fences and stuff like that started uh, blowing down and all kinds of debris was up in the air and uh, best I recall I couldn't call her back. After a while the hail stopped. I remember very well that I, I just had the feeling that something wasn't right. There was one, one tornado that went across the country club area. Then there was another one that pretty much came down 4th Street, uh, missing Texas Tech uh, barely, toppling a lot of the big light poles uh, at the football field, and then went all the way through Overton, on the ground, all the way through uh, into the uh, downtown city. And we were up on the second floor, and I suggested that we probably should all go down downstairs. That, uh, and about the time we were going down the stairs, uh, all of the windows uh, blew in and the, and the, uh, uh, all the glass blew out in the building and much of the glass was still in. I was covered with glass uh, myself. The roof came off of the building. I decided I need, I had my wife, who we lived out in the southwest part of Lubbock. I had a one-year-old daughter uh, at the time, so I was anxious to find out if, any, if they were okay. So I got in my car. You couldn't drive in the street on Broadway because there were high power lines, high voltage lines in the streets. So I drove down the front yards, finally got home, and it turned out that uh, uh, the storm had not uh, done any damage in the southwest uh, part of town. Our uh, commercial facility was totally leveled by the storm. And so I worked in the storm and the debris for many, many weeks. It was the beginning of the National Wind Institute. That's when we got into the research. Uh, at that time we had two young professors that were uh, looking for a research field and we ended up having the whole city of Lubbock as a, uh, as a research uh, venue. If there's any place in the world that uh, is uh, in, in the business in research, in wind, in storms, uh, in storm shelters. Texas Tech has been involved uh, in all of that uh, over the years and is one of the leading institutions in the world in studying severe storms and tornadoes. Our total focus is saving lives. The above ground shelters have saved lots of lives and that's quite gratifying. A major storm has a tendency to pull families, neighborhoods, and communities together, and that's exactly what it did. Texas Tech's leadership in research of extreme weather is not limited to the high winds of tornadoes. They also deploy a team of specialists who research the damaging winds of coastal hurricanes. Let's take a closer look. As a kid, I was always obsessed with thunderstorms. You know, I grew up in outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and we every summer we have a series of thunderstorms that would come through. And so, um, I always liked to just sit outside and watch them come over. I was always interested in them. And so, 
as a young kid even, I would go home after school and my brother and sister would want to watch cartoons and I would watch the Weather Channel. And um, that's just the way it always was all the way through high school and then college and now I'm here doing what I love. I was always curious about weather as a child. I'd sit out in my garage and watch the rain and lightning. Um, and I actually have um, been through a tornado uh, in northern Ohio. Um, and I woke up in the morning with tree branches down and power loss. And so I was always very curious about the impact of, of tornadoes and uh, severe thunderstorms. And so that kind of drew my in attention to that kind of um, subject area. And then all through high school into undergrad, I was very interested in and the field work that we did in undergrad um, and then just continue to pursue that passion all the way through to, the, to today. When a hurricane is approaching the United States, Texas Tech always sends a team out to deploy instrumentation to measure the winds during a landfall event. Um, most of the existing weather stations that are out there generally fail in tropical storm force winds and so we try to go in with research grade platforms to make sure that we can cover the landfall region with uh, wind measurements. So we take platforms similar to the platform right here, we call this stick net. We have 24 of these portable towers that we'll take and put all over the landfall region and try to understand what the, the variability of the wind in, is as the storm makes landfall and, and try to understand what the maximum winds are within a hurricane as well. One of the most unique deployments we ever made was for Hurricane Sandy, which was in 2012. Um, Generally when we deploy we try to go to unpopulated areas um, where we can put platforms up and they're not disrupted by buildings and we don't have to deal with a lot of people and things like that. But uh, Hurricane Sandy obviously made landfall in the northeast and it was very populated, it was very challenging. Um, a team of three of us went and took 12 of these platforms up there and um, a lot of them saw some storm surge. We actually lost our first ever platform on a sand dune because of the storm surge. Um, took it out but all of that you know that happens we're trying to get these measurements right on the edge right on the coastline and so sometimes things happen. Hazard mitigation really to me is studying the small-scale impacts on our structures that we design uh, to withstand the impact of hurricanes, thunderstorms, tornadoes and so it encompasses a large uh, area of research, but typically we're just interested in like how the wind impacts our structures, how does hail impact our structures, all the different components of the meteorological phenomenon, how can we better design uh, our building codes so that we um, mitigate the losses of life and property. I just hope to keep enjoying what I'm doing and, and keep advancing our the science that, that we're doing. Um, I would love to see that the research that we're conducting makes wind farms more productive in the future or that the measurements that we're making in, in landfalling hurricanes leads to better built structures. Just to know that the little things that we're doing contribute to the greater good is, is what it's all about for me. A part of something bigger than myself and that's humbling and uh, I don't ever want to lose focus on that because I think that's what continues to motivate us to do the work that we do. When we come back we hear about a fire truck that saved the lives of first responders and how a clock has immortalized that moment in time. This is Texas Tech University. We inspire. We discover. We succeed. We ride. We share our traditions. And our innovations. We are champions. We work hard. And play louder. We are many things. But wherever we go. And whatever we do. Every day. Every day. Todos los días. Every day. Every day, we are Red Raiders. First responders braved many challenges in the face of tragedy. When the tornado struck in 1970 in Lubbock, Fire and Rescue found that their first challenge was to save themselves. Captain Nick Wilson explains the story. The clock here that you see in the display case is the actual clock, one of the clocks from Central Fire Station, which was located at the 5th and Avenue K. And the firefighters uh, that were there in the station at the time that the tornado struck the city uh, actually took c cover underneath the fire truck that was in the station and that's what saved their lives as the building collapsed on top of the fire truck. And of course the clock here with the time is the exact moment that the tornado struck and that the clock stopped at the fire station. You know, I, I guess what I get out of it is just, you know, the respect for the weather, for nature, for what a wind can do, even 
you know, where it's, it's not necessarily a tornado, it's just a severe thunderstorm, the amount of damage that can be caused by hail. And, and you can only imagine how bad it would be if an F5 tornado or, or something similar were to come through a, you know, a populated area like here in Lubbock. We really start the response for a severe weather event before that event ever occurs. Uh, we spend a lot of preparation through the year just because you know, not only the history here in Lubbock, but if you look at, you know, nationwide and the part of the country that we're in, we know we're, we're at, a, at a high risk for severe weather. In the early hours of an event like a large tornado really is one of the most challenging things, uh, particularly tornadoes that occur at night. A, a lot of times it's not until the next morning when the sun comes up that we can really get a good grasp of the scope of, of the incident. People that are calling for help and even rescuers that are trying to describe where they're at, like you said, all those landmarks are gone, trees are gone, street signs are gone, houses, all those things that we're familiar with that help us find our way and really get a reference point of where we are and where we need to go, those things are gone. So, so even, even people that have lived in a neighborhood their entire lives suddenly find themselves lost. I'm very fortunate. I have one of the greatest jobs in the world. Uh, really one of the best things about this job is no two days are ever the same. Uh, you know, I knew even when I was in college that I didn't want to sit behind a desk eight to five and really have that same monotonous thing every day. And that's really the great thing about this job is, is that every day you come to work, you get to see and experience something new. You know, everybody wants to, to focus on, on first responders and firefighters being brave, and that is an aspect of it. But honestly, the real challenge is finding those people that, that have the composure and the intelligence to really be thinkers in those situations because that ultimately is what makes it successful. Respect the past and embrace the future. There's a lot of things from the past that we can learn from, but there's a lot of things that we did in the past that we should have learned from that we did wrong. You know, just because we've always done something that way doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right way to do it. And I just encourage those people to always continue to improve, to find a better way, to learn from the mistakes, uh, you know, and, and the bad things that have happened in the past and apply those to the future to, to be successful, to, to ensure that, that, that this department and first responders and, are always getting better. When we come back, we take a look at a memorial for that fateful day in 1970 that not only serves as a reminder of the lives lost, but also as a center for the community to come together. From the director of the Civil War, baseball, and the national parks, comes a revealing portrait of three extraordinary lives. We wouldn't be who we are without them. A saga spanning two world wars and more than a hundred years. The drama of it is unmatched in our history. From Ken Burns, The Roosevelt's An Intimate History. The following morning, my father and I decided we were going to venture into the Guadalupe neighborhood. And you could see all the debris on the streets and, you know, tree limbs. There's like nothing there. I mean, all the structures had been uh, half flattened out. I recall one scene there was a, a just like the doorway of, of, of a home, of the front door. And that's all that was there. There was nothing behind it. And it's just, just, kindling wood just everywhere. Uh, and that was, that was pretty amazing going through all of that. More frightening than the tornado itself was the aftermath, the sheer sight of the destruction which leveled the Guadalupe neighborhood in Lubbock. But citizens would not sit idly by. It was a significantly changing event that really propelled the city into the next sort of era um, because it was so devastating not only in terms of uh, life loss, but also in terms of just massive destruction, um, gave the city an opportunity to kind of come together and reshape several areas, um, most, most importantly probably the downtown area and the Guadalupe neighborhood. In the days following the tornado, a commission was formed to decide how the rebuilding process would occur. The Citizens Advisory Commission, led by A.C. Werner, decided a memorial should be built, but not just a statue or plaque. Rather, an entire civic center should be constructed to honor those who passed and to recognize the community spirit of Lubbock. Promoted a sense of cooperation throughout the city that, that probably wasn't there prior to that. Um, and 
the establishment of a facility such as the Civic Center made the city look more like a, a larger metropolitan uh, type area? We host a lot of local events. Uh, the Civic Center uh, generally does. Uh, a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations host their, uh, their fundraisers here. And of course, we just finished up the rodeo. Uh, the Civic Center, we've seen a big run right here around the springtime uh, with the Arts Festival, uh, those type of events. It's all in the name. Um, and we remember that uh, every time, we, you know, every day we come to work. It's all in the name a memorial to the 26 lives lost, a living symbol of a city that faced with the destruction and devastation of an EF5 tornado, came together and built a place for the community to never forget. You know, it's more than just a building. It's more than just a, a place for concerts and events and meetings. Um, but I hope uh, pieces like this will remind people when they come to the Civic Center to see a performance or to attend a conference or whatever that they'll Remember, again, that this is more than just a building than a facility, that it was built for a purpose. Well, I think it, it's more, uh, it's a larger remembrance uh, in honoring those people um, that, that lost their lives uh, because it natural disaster is no one's fault. Uh, Mother Nature just kicked in. Uh, but again, it's, it's the entire building uh, that, that is uh, a memorial for those individuals. The storm in 1970 opened the eyes of Texas Tech administration to the importance of campus preparedness. Communication and technology has evolved since 1970, leading to new ways in which Texas Tech prepares its students, faculty, and staff for extreme weather. We would begin monitoring the weather when it comes into the area, so we start watching it. Uh, but let's say that severe weather uh, is approaching or is now in Lubbock County. We would begin alerting the university community to seek shelter. You know, if it was a severe hailstorm, if it was a tornado, something that could cause serious damage or harm to individuals. We would begin alerting the university community to seek shelter. It's important that we get that message out as quickly as possible and and by having prepared messages, which we do, we have prepared messages for uh, many scenarios, uh, that helps cut that time, even if by a minute or two, it can be valuable in a, in a time of emergency. Tech Alert System is one we subscribe to through a company, and what it does, it offers four opportunities for you to be contacted through uh, your home phone, cell phone, voicemail, uh, email, text. We can uh, craft messages that automatically go out through the system, and, and they hit. Uh, Usually within five minutes, everybody has, has the message in one form or another. We would also use social media, uh, post it on Facebook, Twitter. We would try to communicate with the university community in every medium that we could. One thing we'll do is any anytime uh, there is a threat, we're going to offer advice. And, and what is recommended by Texas Tech Police Department, the National Weather Service, if that's to stay in place or shelter in place, uh, go to low-lying ground if you're outside, whatever it may be, we're going to share those uh, suggestions to you. The locations of shelter uh, would depend on where, where they're at, uh, but we do have plans. Uh, each building across campus has an emergency action plan. When I was at Kansas State University as Provost and Senior Vice President, we actually did have a tornado go right through the middle of campus. It did $11 million in damage, and uh, so that required, even as Provost, uh, some, some significant input as far as the response to, to that event. And we were able to mobilize our facilities people to reassign them from projects they may have been working on to campus cleanup and uh, some of the uh, immediate responses that needed to, to take place to make sure that the facilities were worthy of having classes and continue with the operations as best we could. I feel like I'm well prepared, but, but part of it is my team, and I think we've got an excellent team of people working for me, and again, I think Ronald Phillips has a lot of experience in risk management, but we have excellent people in facilities in our campus safety group, and our communications group. Uh, all of those elements are very important as we try to address anything that we might face here at Texas Tech. Thanks so much for joining us on Inside Texas Tech. For all of these stories and more, visit KTTZ.org or Texas Tech Public Television. I'm Robert Giovanetti.